When we look at that, we notice uh, in chapter 19, there's really three sections. We see that he's uh, condemned by Pilate and the Jews, and then there he's crucified, and that's where we ended last week. Do you remember his last words on the cross that are recorded in John's gospel? All right, and that's not a, a words of defeat, but it's words of victory. I, I've done it. I've accomplished. I've finished the race. And so uh, it's, it's a word of, uh, of success rather than defeat. Well, now we're in the last section, and it's the only uh, short, but it, it deals with the burial of Christ. And now it's important that we understand that he was buried. And if we were going to do a apologetics class, we would go to Matthew and the other accounts and, and describe how the, the tomb was sealed it was secured. Now, why did that all go on? They seal the tomb and secure it with a guard and all that. All right. Well, and the apostle, they're afraid the apostle was going to steal the body and claim that he arose and all that. So um, uh, it's important for us to note this. He was not just buried, but he was locked in that grave. And so it makes the resurrection even more profound. But John doesn't deal a lot with that because the resurrection in itself is profound enough because the tomb does show up empty. So we're in uh, verse 38. After these sayings, Joseph of Arimathea, being the disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission, and he came therefore and took up the body, away his body. And Nicodemus came also, who had first come to him by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. And they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen, wrappings with the spices, as the burial custom the Jews. Now in those places, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, on the account of the Jewish day of preparation, because the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, very simple, but what strikes you about this account, first of all? What strikes you about it? All right, first thing, two men are preparing the body, and you might think it would be women. Second of all, they were secret disciples, Joseph of Arimathea, and the second one was... Nicodemus, where did we learn about him? John chapter 3. He came by Jesus by night. Now we know that they're afraid of the Jews because the Jews already said in John chapter 12, remember there in verse 47, many of the rulers were believing on him, but because, what? Well, that's right. It says, the Jews had said, anyone that confessed Christ will be put out of the synagogue, and they love the approval of man more than the approval of God. So here we have two. Now, uh, Joseph of Arimathea is said to be a ruler, uh, a rich man. Uh, they're, uh, Nicodemus, they're part of the council. These are well-placed individuals in Jewish society. Are they secret any longer? No. And there's something about them that even though they didn't believe in the resurrection or expect it, they understood who Jesus was and they said, it doesn't matter what the Jews think, we're going to ask for his body and at our expense, we're going to give him the burial he deserves. Isn't that significant, isn't it? All right. So we'll just look at some of the things there. Now, yes. Probably not. Yes, because and we'll make note of that. He asked if you didn't hear it, would he have gotten this kind of burial if would, these two men would have done that? No, no most likely not. Um, if it's a day of preparation, we know this is the Passover week. They call it a high Sabbath. It's special because it's in this week where the Passover lamb is sacrificed to make atonement for Israel. They did it every year. And of course, not coincidence that God has his son a sacrificial lamb being offered for everyone. Well, they don't want this body being left up on the cross to defile this week. And so uh, the Roman custom was to leave the body just rot up there. 
and let the birds and the animals kind of pick at it. Now, again, that would be a, a, a sign, don't you defy the political power of Rome, because this is what happens to you. Would that be a strong deterrent? Well, the Jews said, we don't want anything to do with that, because this is this high day. Now, it's interesting. Did they have any scruples and problem with murdering an innocent person? Did they have any problems with disobeying God's law about how a, a court procedure should be carried about with witnesses and not during night? No, they could set up aside God's law, but when it comes to, we don't want to be defiled, we don't want this wonderful uh, Passover week, you know, to have two bodies laying there. So in other words, hide any kind of uh, 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 imagery that would point to our own sin, right? There's this, this inconsistency or a hypocrisy, really. Um, it's, uh, here we have... Um, This, uh, Clark writes this, and I can't say this word, lactantius, um, but they would break the legs of the criminals because it would hasten their death, because I guess they could linger a long time on the cross. And so uh, uh, if you could breathe, I mean, lift yourself up on the spike that's between in your ankles, which would be terrific, right? Horrific just the pain, you could uh, get a breath, then you'd sink back down. And then, but the weight of your body and all that, you'd, it'd be hard to breathe, so you'd have to lift up again. And it was just this compression up and down. But to not breathe is terrible, so you'd endure the pain of lifting up. And then when you could take it no more, you'd fall back down. So then they come along with a big metal bar or a wooden club and just break your bones. And so now you can't lift yourself up. And so you would die rather quickly then because of suffocation. So um, here we find that uh, they asked Pilate their legs might be broken, so they might be taken away. Let's just get this done. Uh, we read in another account uh, that uh, Pilate was just amazed that they'd uh, he wanted to make sure they were dead before he released them. So the soldiers came. They broke the legs of the first man and one of the other who was crucified with him. And it's interesting, the first man and one of the other. Well, one of those men was who? That would be the, the person that Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Did he have to suffer in order to go to heaven before he went to heaven? That, that, that thief, right? He did, didn't he? But it doesn't matter because in the end, he's with Jesus in paradise. And so the other one, he uh, had his legs broken and, you know, he had nothing to do with God or Christ. Um, but the coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But then one of the soldiers pierced his side. Now, um, with a spear. Now, there's a couple of things that's interesting here. And actually, um, two things I want to draw together here. I should have started in verse 31 in our reading. I apologize. Um, when he pierced his side, did he obey Pilate's command, first of all, to have their legs broken? Now, that's just interesting enough because he was there to break their legs. But he ascertains he's already dead, so he doesn't even bother breaking his legs. And he says, we'll just do a final test. And he jabs his spear in his side. Now, I have up there John chapter 20 because Thomas, and we'll read him next week, Lord willing, said, I won't believe that Jesus is Christ until I see the, put my fingers in the holes in his hands and then put my hand in his side. He used the word fingers, and then he uses the word hand. So how big was this hole in his side? Some say a hand's width, you know, big enough where you could, you know. And he wants to know that this is actually the risen physical body of Jesus Christ, who's now once dead, but now is alive. So when he gushed him or he hit him with his spear, it was a, a, quite a thrust and ripped open his side. 
uh, when uh, Luke Chandler was here, he did a little presentation on uh, the, the crucifixion. And we think of him being way up high. He was probably, you know, if I were to stand on here, just that high or maybe a little higher. Not that, not that high uh, raised up. And so it wouldn't be a long spear. It'd just be something just like that. And then what came forth? Water mixed with blood. We won't spend the time, but we could in another lesson. This is an instant autopsy uh, uh, proving his death because they say that when uh, water uh, uh, and, you know, the heart is under trauma, the fluid collects around the heart and the lungs and blood mixes with the water and when you have death. And so when he speared, uh, hitting that, when that both came out, it proved without a shadow of a doubt he was dead at that time. And, of course, it, if he wasn't dead, what would that have done? <laughs> It would have finished him off. And so the reason I think th this is left for us is to, so you could know assuredly, this man was dead. Now, why is that so important that we point that out? Because, yeah, he's going to rise. Now, some have suggested to explain away the empty tomb that he feigned death or he was taken down off the cross before he died and they call it the swoon theory, theory. And actually, he somehow revived in the clammy, cold tomb and uh, pushed open the rock, overcome the Roman soldiers, and escaped. All right? Does that seem reasonable to you in any stretch of the imagination? Well, of course not. But what's important is note right here. He's dead. There's no doubt about it. And they would have been in much trouble if they would have given up the body without proving to Pilate, first of all, he's actually dead. Because that's why they were sent out there, right? Just to prove that he was dead. So I just want you to see that. He is dead, and um, we do see blood and water come out. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and he summoned the centurion and asked him if he had been dead for some time. So there's no doubt in our mind that he actually died here on the cross. Um, when he who saw had seen this testified, who's speaking right there? John is speaking of himself again, all right? The one who wrote this uh, gospel. He says his testimony is true, and he knows he's telling you the truth that you also may believe. Because these came to pass and fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. Uh, that's in Psalm 34. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on whom they pierce. That's in Zechariah chapter 12. It's interesting. In Exodus 12, it says, when you offer the Passover lamb, it can't have any broken bones. So it's not a coincidence. Now, when it says these things came to pass to fulfill scripture, when was that observation made? While Christ is being plunged with a spear and not having his bones broken, or after the resurrection, that John looks back and goes, whoa, now I understand that prophecy. See what I'm saying? It was, exactly. It was afterwards. And so he's not putting this in there. He said, well, we somehow manufactured it so he wouldn't have his bones broken so we could fulfill the scripture. No, they're looking back and showing... Look at all the evidence to prove that Jesus was the Christ. He fulfilled scripture after scripture or prophecy after prophecy. Are you with me? All right. So that's really kind of significant because the custom was break their bones. They were told to break his bones and his bones didn't get broken. All right. Who's in charge? Again, I just wanted to point that out. It's, it's Jesus. All right. And God's in charge. So here this Joseph, the secret one, he comes and asks that, uh, that they might take the body away. And uh, he came by night with Nicodemus, and they bring this mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. Now that would be, uh, if it's in their measure, uh, it'd be like 70, 75 pounds of American pounds of, of this mixture of these spices and uh, things to help preserve the body. And when they wrap them, uh, we're going to see wrappings, wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. So you can look and read how they 
tomb someone or prepare them from death, they would take a long strip of burial cloth and wrap it around them sort of like we would think a mummy. But as they're wrapping it, they would sprinkle these uh, spices and, and, and the myrrh and aloe in between all the wrappings. And so you'd wrap it and there'd be another layer, another layer. You with me? 75 pounds, if that's how much it was, that's a lot to be encased around you, but it's to keep the body from stinking and help absorb the moisture and all those kind of things because they usually had outside tombs where they buried them, not in the ground six foot under. And that's still the case today. So you don't want this odor and all that, but you got to see a lot of cloth wrapped around you with layers of the, these spices and stuff. 75 pounds, are you getting out of that even if you were alive? Probably the fierce, scariest thing is to be buried alive. You know, you hear stories of that, and of course they make terror movies based on it. People scratch in at a coffin. Can you imagine waking up if you weren't dead and you're encased in a... No, you're not getting out. And again, that's why this is given to us, but also showing the, the majesty that he deserves, you know, in his burial. Just the reverence, because he is Lord and King. All right? Um... That's the burial custom. Then they'd put a cloth around his head, a burial cloth, like a, just a napkin we would think it of, and, but his face would be exposed, and then all this wrapping around him, and then he'd be laid on a shelf uh, in a cave that's caught out by hand, and the shelf would be just a rock slab, you know, in the rock cave. It's not like a... a something built there. It's just a little niche that's cut out, and you can see them to this day. And these rich man tombs, they'd have a lot of these shelves cut out, so dad, mom, son, daughter, grandchildren, they all could be buried in the same, you know, place because, you know, it's expensive to bury someone, and a rich man would have a little home (laughs) where all his relatives could be buried together. And then you would have a stone that would be rolled in front of the door, but when it's rolled out, you could go in there and offer, you know, uh, you'd have to have your little uh, lanterns. You know, we've shown you those. They're little oil lamps. And then they'll have little places cut out in the the sides of the cave where they could place those. And you can still see the the burnt smoke of the olive oil, you know, the residue on the cave wall in some of these places. But you go in there and... and you could walk and be inside the tomb, and there would be these niches around you, and there would be like a little gathering area in the middle. So it's just an idea of the picture, what this might have been like. Did you? All right. Um, when you go to Israel, there's two places where they think the tomb of Jesus. This is the garden tomb outside. The other one's inside the uh, city walls, and there's a rock little area, and they have built a little smaller sepulcher over it, or a, um, what am I thinking of, the word, not a cathedral, but a, huh, well, it's like a canopy, but then there's a huge church built over that, I mean, it's just, can you imagine, everything that has anything remotely connected, they think, to Jesus, they're going to make some kind of uh, wonderful site, huh, a monument to it, of course, no one knows for sure where he's buried, Now, again, would that be God's wisdom? Because he doesn't want you to worship the site. He wants you to worship Jesus. That's right? Yes. Yes. Because it says in that place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb which no one had yet been laid. So it's very close to the area of the crucifixion. Is that what you're pointing out? Yeah. Okay. So again, because the Jewish day of preparation, the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And that's all really we have of it. So that's John 19. Any questions or thoughts about that? Um, now we're going to see in chapter 20 uh, his resurrection. We can break it down into three parts too. The first of all is the empty tomb. And it's going to be discovered first by Mary Magdalene. And then Peter and John were going to verify it. 
Then we're going to see a series of appearances that Jesus appears on this resurrection day, Sunday, to various people. And then we're going to see a purpose statement that you all memorize, right? Verses 30 and 31. Many other <laughs> signs were written, but these have been written that what? That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you might have life in his name, right? So, but let's look at the empty tomb to start with, okay? Because... That's where it all starts. And again, how brief John is in his description uh, uh, cries out the hi historical accuracy of what happened. There's no embellishing of this account. There's no drama, not trying to pull out emotions, even though Mary's going to be crying. And we're going to section here. So on the first day of the week, what day would that be? Sunday, all right? What have they just finished doing the day before? Observing the Sabbath. And it was the Sabbath of the Passover week. So this week is now finished where the Passover lamb, there have been thousands of them offered, so death could pass over and reminding them of that event in Exodus chapter 12. But now, in reality, God's lamb has been offered, right? And death is now going to be able to pass over anyone that comes to Jesus and get his blood on them. So on Sunday, when that week is done, he rises from the dead. And that's why now Christians worship him on Sunday because we're not Jews. We're not bound to keep the Sabbath, the seventh day or Saturday. But it all starts right here. So on the first day of the week, you can read this count in Luke 24, uh, Matthew, Mark. They all give different details and different, uh, actually, incidents. But here we're going to learn about Mary Magdalene. And to our best understanding, she came with some other women. You'll read that in Matthew's account. But John just mentions Mary. I don't think it's two separate instances. He just draws attention to Mary because she's the one that actually is going to meet Jesus later. So she came early in the tomb while it was still dark. By the way, when did the day of the week or your day, new day start for a Jewish calendar? At night, at 6 o'clock, when the sun went down, that's when the new day starts. So this is sometime between 6 at night and 6 in the morning the next day. That's when Sunday started for them. You with me? So we don't know what time it is exactly according to this text. But it's still dark. And she saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Some suggest that she's coming to finish the job that Joseph and Nicodemus had started. And uh, to maybe just to grieve. And, and But what do we know about Mary Magdalene? Help me real quick. No, she wasn't the prostitute. She's the one that had the seven demons, right? Yeah. And they're all cast out. She was tormented by Satan all these years of her life, seven of them, and she becomes a disciple of Christ, one of his close friends. Well, yeah, and then, uh, and then they say there's involvement with Jesus her, with her, but, right, so, yes, so she saw the stones already taken away from the tomb, and so she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple. Who's that? John. He's speaking of himself. Whom Jesus loved. And said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. Now, she goes to the, the tomb and implied in there in this text is she looks inside and what? It's empty. And she goes back to... Uh, Peter and John, and says, they've taken away the Lord, and we don't know where they've laid him. So question, does she expect Jesus to rise from the dead? Because what does her language say? We don't know where they've taken him and where they have laid him. She wants to know so she can go attend to him. She expects him still to be dead. She is startled and troubled, not because he's risen, but because the body is missing. Who would steal the body 
of our Savior. I mean, she didn't know the Savior, but our, our Lord. I mean, how disrespectful it is to steal someone's body, all right? That's where she's coming from. Uh-huh. Well, that's going to come up, all right? Now, when we look at this section right here, um, what's really interesting, and, and a lot has been made about this, when the Jews, whether you like it or not, in that society, in that day, women were not allowed to testify in court. And if they did give testimony, it was regarded as really not of any value. Now, again, doesn't matter if you think that's sexist or whatever. That's the way it was culturally. Now, why would I bring that out? Because who does God use as his first witness to the resurrection? A woman. So if you're going to create a, out of a fictional account and try to pass it off as being true, would you, in your deceitful gospel that you're trying to con people with, Use a woman as your first witness. So John, if he's trying to manufacture this whole story, why would he do that? So the, I guess the real question is, why did he use a woman as the first witness? And there's really only one answer. Who said that? Because that's what happened. There's no way he can get around it. She was the first one to see the tomb being empty. And whether you like her as a witness or not, I have to report, John says, what happened? And I think it gives more credibility to the empty tomb and the resurrection than if it was been a man. Yes? Yes. And actually, we're going to draw some parallels to that, so I appreciate you saying that. Yes? I don't know. I can't answer that because that's a, a dilemma I have never read an answer to. Because we know from the other accounts, there's squadrons of soldiers, you know, four at a time that are guarding the tomb under the threat of death. They don't let anyone steal it, and the tomb is sealed with a string or some type of rope across it with this. And if that seal is broken, that means someone's tampered with the king's seal, and that's punishable by death. So this place is secure. I don't know how Mary thinks he's going to get in there. doesn't say. So she came and says they've taken the Lord. That's her assumption. Is that a safe assumption? Someone stole the body or taken it? Now who would take it? Would that be an easy thing to do? You know, 70 pounds wrapped up. You got to overcome the guards and, you know, defeat them, probably kill them, move the stone, and then take the body, okay? But that's what she assumed. Now, in Luke chapter 24, it says, these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. Hmm. What does that tell you about what I said is about women's witnesses? They're caught up in this cultural problem that women, they just get hysterical or dramatic and emotional, and she just probably went to the wrong tomb. And so it says it, it was like nonsense and just rejected them totally. Now, other than their cultural bias towards women, what would be the other reason it would be nonsensical to them, this report? Exactly. Just the thought that someone could take the body of Jesus against all the securities in place, that's crazy talk. That's not happening. All right? So now there's an exception, though. Um, and there's Craig, his quoting the same thing about women. Uh, but Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. Now, what does that show? They're, they must believe her to some degree. And they're running to find out for themselves because this is astounding. And uh, the other disciple out around Peter. So who's the faster of the two? John. Just a little tidbit of information. <laughs> and he reached the tomb first. And he bent over and looked in at the strips lining there but did not go in. So John just comes up and looks in. So obviously looking down. 
and he sees the, the linen burial clothes, but he doesn't go in. Probably because, what, fear, just excitement, respect, uh, not knowing what he's going to find. The word looked, he looked at the strips, is this word to clearly see a material object. It's not just to see, but it's the idea to, to look and see it clearly, identify it. And he's using this language because he sees the strips of linen lying there. Now, who comes up next? Well, Peter, it says, came along behind him. And here's John. And he just runs right by him, just runs right into the tomb. <laughs> Isn't that Peter? Not just impetuous, but just all us, you know, the one to take action. He went straight into the tomb, and he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. And the cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Now, the word saw here is a word in Greek to mean to contemplate, to observe, scrutinize, to look at carefully and try to reason, what does this tell me what I'm looking at? What happened here? So here's what I want you to see. He had this linen wrapped around him with all the, the spices. And what is he looking at when he sees that? The cocoon, if you would, but there's nothing inside it. And then where the head was, what do you see? The napkin just falling flat with a space in between the two. Isn't that what it says? And so to a person that's looking at what he's seeing here, the body just what? Somehow disappeared from this embalming process. Yes. Yes. And he says, untie him and let him go. That's what he meant, untie him. Loosen him, all this stuff that's encased around him. They're proof of what you're saying. That's right. And it's interesting, John uses this word here that he's looking at it, and because he's trying to put this together, he's going, what happened here? Now, again, if we were in apologetics class, we would just deal with this at length. If you were going to steal the body, would you take time to unwrap him? No, you would take the body in, run. But this was all put in order. Everything, it looked like it, nothing's been disturbed. The only thing is the body's missing. So if the thieves were going to do it, if the disciples stole the body or someone else, they would have taken the whole body encased in the tomb, right? Or in the wrappings. This, again, points to the fact that not only the tomb is empty, but the body is missing Something amazing has happened. Now, here's this language um, um, by John in verse 8. Finally, the other disciple, who's that? He reached, who reached the tomb first, he went inside. And I want you to see these, this one sentence. He saw, and he what? He believed. Now, I think I have a word for saw here. It's another word to understand, to perceive the significance of. It's the word Aiden in the Greek. So in other words, oh, I see. Do we use that? Oh, I see. What do we mean when I say, oh, I see? I get it. I understand. So we use the word see for a lot of different things as well, and that's what he's doing here. He understands. And he believes. What does he believe? Doesn't tell us, but it's just simple. He saw What has been Jesus been telling him? They're going to kill me. I'm going to be buried. In three days, I will rise again. Here, you could say it's the first Christian, the first believer in Christ raised from the dead, John. He saw and he believed. Let me just say this to you. This faith is going to be a product of just what you do internally. Or do you need some outside evidence to look at? It says he saw, but yet he had to do his own work individually in his heart. He had to put this together, two and two, like what's going on here? And we looked at the evidence that's presented, you know, this cocoon, the thing that's empty, and the, he believed. Now you say, is that a leap or is it prompted by evidence that's reasonable, logical? Yes, it's prompted by that, but then in the end, you just, 
it is a choice to believe the evidence for what it says that he, he is raised, has raised from the dead and he is the, who he said he was. Yeah, Gary. Yeah. Um, never thought of that. It was an empty tomb. No one had been laid there, so he was there by himself. Good. All right. So they still don't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to be raised from the dead. John puts that in later. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. All right. So now we're going to look at a series of resurrection appearances. Okay. And um, and when we do this, there's going to be uh, first with Mary and. Be- there's going to be others that are listed in other accounts that John won't deal with. For example, Jesus walks with two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, all right? Uh, one was Cleopas, or wasn't that his name? Um, it doesn't list that here. But it's going to give um, uh, Mary, the other disciples, uh, then Thomas by himself, and again, to prove that Jesus was actually physically raised from the dead. So, um, let me get my glasses. We're in chapter 20. What verse? Verse 4. Uh, no, excuse me. Verse uh, 10, 11. 11. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. So she must have followed them as well, right? Um, And what is she crying about? Someone stole the body. And so she wept. She stopped and looked into the tomb. And behold, two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been laying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when he had said this, she turned around, and behold, Jesus standing there. Whether in the tomb or outside the tomb, he's just in this close proximity. And did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, second time she's asked, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, maybe because she doesn't look up in his face and doesn't recognize him because of her grief, we don't know for sure. She says, sir, if you have carried him away, would that be an easy task? No. Tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. What devotion. How is she going to handle the body of Christ by herself? That's of no concern. She just wants to tend to him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. It's one word. And she turned and said to him, Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. We'll stop there. Now, this is really significant that um, and it goes all the way back to um, really the garden because when we look at Genesis chapters 1 through 3 when it all started, we see Adam and Eve, and they're put in the garden. And who comes down and walks with them? God. Because on the occasion that she ate that forbidden fruit then offered it to her husband, who ate also, if we find in chapter 3 that God was walking the garden, and the, the Adam and Eve heard God walk in the garden, and so they ran and hid. And that's when God speaks to them. It's like, where are you? So it's interesting that here we have paradise, right? Paradise on this earth. They, they didn't have to work except just tend to the garden. They didn't have to plant or reap. There were no uh, a pain in childbirth. There was no thorns or thickets or anything like that. It was just really paradise. And they had the tree of life. They were intended to live forever. But because of Eve's choice being tempted by Satan, she chose to... Uh, disobey God, ate of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then we see the fall of man. You know, man is just in a fallen state in many ways. That, And here we now, we're on the first day of the week, and where are we? 
in a garden, right? And here we have Jesus, or God in the flesh, and who's he appearing to? A woman. A woman who for most of her life has been bound by Satan. And where did that all start? This curse or this fallen state of man is when Eve ate of this fruit and brought these curses upon the world. And here we have a woman who's been released from that bind, bound, bondage of Satan, you know, when Jesus casts out the demons. But it's, is it, again, a coincidence or ordained that Jesus appears to a woman, first of all, and reveals himself to her? And she's crying. Maybe because that's all what mankind's been doing for all these years is just crying. People that are seeking God, at least. Those that are calling on his name. That's the, the, the operative phrase in the Old Testament. If those that are trying to seek God are calling on his name, calling out for mercy, calling out for grace. And, and the language is coupled with the idea of they, they're walked with God. They tried to, to uh, walk with him in their life. Even though he's in heaven, they're trying to follow him. And so what is she doing in the garden? She's crying. Just tell me where you've taken my Lord, and I'll go get him. And then Jesus says one word. He doesn't say, it's me. It's Jesus. I rose from dead. What does he say? He knows who he is and what he is. He just says one word. And he doesn't say, in a diminutive way, he calls her by her first name, a personal name, Mary. And that's all he says, and immediately she knows what? It's Jesus. Now, it's interesting. She sees two angels. Is she uh, bothered by them? Maybe she didn't realize they were angels at the time, and John just records that for our benefit, but I just can't help but think that anytime you see an angel, people are going, what's going on here? It's an angel. But she is so consumed by her master, her Lord being God, his body, that even when she sees angels, doesn't bother. She's weeping. They go, why are you crying? Said, so they've taken my Lord. She turns around and she thinks he's a gardener. Why are you crying? They've taken my Lord. And when was God removed from us? All of us. It's when we've sinned and fallen short of his glory. But now because of the Passover lamb being offered and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now we see that paradise is restored. Not on this earth, but what? What did he tell the thief on the cross? Today you will be with me in paradise. But now Christ walks or God walks with mankind again. And he starts with who? A woman. Now what does she do immediately? Right here. She clings to him, and that's where Jesus has to say, don't hold on to me. Now, it's, the old King James says, don't touch me. That's really not the language. She's hanging on to him like, You're, I lost you once. I'm not going to lose you again. And she says, Mary, it's okay. Don't hang on because I got to send to my father and go tell my brothers, not the disciples, not my servants. What does he call those other gentlemen? my brothers, and tell them, I'm ascending my father, your father, to my God and your God. Relationships have been restored. We'll pick it up next week. Thank you.